Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. Small, far away. Small, far away. I forget. I forget. The Ken's laser. Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to another episode of Occam's Laser. Sean and Dilta here. Um, <laughs> hi, Sean. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a few things today. Um, there was recent news that uh, researchers in Yale had reanimated pig brains outside of their bodies. I see. Reanimated is a strong word. I actually yeah. accidentally used reanimate there, but what I meant to say was that they got some cell activity going. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then uh, later on, we'll talk a bit about the relative sizes of different beings and how that affects their experience of life, I guess. Um, so, Sean, what is pigginess? What does it mean? <laughs> Uh, you should have definitely opened with some pig zombie question. If pig zombies no, no, are soon to zombie. rule <laughs> ruin the world. <laughs> but so the the authors who published this paper, uh, they should have definitely used the word zombie in the title of the paper in Nature. Like, uh, yeah, that would have that would have been worth it. I think to be to say something like zombified pigs return <laughs> yeah. in the form of brains <laughs> yeah. Yeah. with help of Yale researchers. So, so to recap the study, these researchers took a load of pigs' heads from an abattoir, um, took the brains out of the skulls, yeah. hooked them up to this system they developed called BrainX, which sounds very futuristic, and then see uh, checked out to see if they could make the brains do stuff, even though they've been dead for like four hours. Um, very black mirror. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like I feel like it's at the end or the kind of edge of the ethical boundary there. Um, but I want to talk about Brain X. Like, what were they just trying to be like Space X and <laughs> yeah. just decided because it's spelt with an EX instead of just a capital X? I just, yeah. Weird. Maybe they're going for like an ex machina kind of effect. Yeah. I don't really understand. Exo instead. But, um, yeah. It all it does is well, all it does, but it seems to just be a machine <laughs> that pumps in fake blood. But um, but it's cool that they had to put in um, chemicals to not to stop the neurons from firing because they were afraid. So they didn't want to. Their plan wasn't to actually make the brain conscious again because they didn't want. Uh, brain activity to spark up on the pig to be like what the fuck i'm in a, <laughs> I'm so, in a machine so yeah i think that that's also like kind of a part of i don't want to have to deal with the ethical issues of bringing consciousness back to a disembodied brain yeah but, so they just wanted to see if it could work in terms of um producing energy and all that kind of um, yeah like the, if the cells would work if the nutrients would move to the proper places and if oxygen would actually be delivered to brain cells etc it was cool, though, that they were ready uh, with anesthetics if they saw any brain activity start to appear, um, which is kind of kind of cool. It's kind of, it's kind of worrying as well that they just weren't really sure. They're like, well, let's just have the anesthetic ready yeah. because who knows what could happen. There's <laughs> no way. It's an experiment. Like. No way it was anesthetic. There's a PhD student with an axe behind it and someone saying, if this graph peaks... <laughs> If hit this, it yeah if this line if this line that's just measuring like activity if this goes above this other line yeah. yes is it a zombie region over here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just a smack but, but the, um no go ahead i was gonna say the ethics is something that really kind of took me off on a sidetrack for a while because uh it seems so like it would be uh, there would be so much red tape around it but there's actually none because Firstly, animals who are raised for food are, are exempt from any um, testing. You can do what you want to them. So they were originally raised for agriculture, brought mm -hmm. to an abattoir and killed. And then second of all, there's no ethics involved with reanimating something 
that's uh, that's already dead. Um, so they're kind of they. I mean, they were good and they still consulted with ethics ethics boards and stuff, but they didn't have to do anything. They could just, you know, go for that's it. That's really weird because it was it was one thing I was considering, like why pigs, but obviously it was just convenience. And you know, like why not? Road, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like why not any other animal? But um, obviously just because it's commonly slaughtered animal that appears in many butchers and stuff is probably just the yeah. handiest thing to use yeah race for food is good um it, it is something similar that i thought about i hadn't come across the answer but i was wondering like is it easier to get around those ethical qualms if the animal has already been killed for other purposes and is already dead but it's weird that there's no other rules on reanimating things obviously it probably is something that they just didn't consider actually possible no. and still as of now isn't possible but it's still weird that there isn't an ethical rule or like a violation in, in in stopping people from trying to bring something back to life like yeah i don't know yeah. frankenstein yeah i guess it was so sci-fi even probably a decade ago um and there's this parallel race going on between people who think oh ai will become conscious but before that people might just actually like rather than figure out how to program consciousness, they might just figure out how to restore it in dead brains. Yeah, there's that whole kind of issue of immortality, I guess, is if you can just keep bringing life back to a dead brain. Like, surely over time, tissue would degrade. So one thing they said is, yeah, that, that they, they're not stopping aging at all. So if they... Uh, ever did this to a human brain it would still age and and eventually mm -hmm. degrade normally um but but what's weird is that there are like hundreds of people who have paid to have their brains uh frozen after death yeah and like all around the what's world it, cryonics yeah so i mean that's just odd yeah but the premise there is that they have it all frozen just kind of and and they sign something basically saying that we don't have the technology to bring you back been frozen it's um uh what's the word vitrification where they essentially like uh your blood goes solid but you're not actually frozen it's like mm -hmm. you make it like jelly kind of um but yeah there's no guarantee that they'll actually be revived or yeah. when they would be revived they're just ass assuming that at some point in the future humans will develop the technology to be able to revive you but they don't even know if the process you go through to put you into that position would work. You know, what if they develop a technology to bring you back to life, but the way they were you kind of, yeah. you know, put to death doesn't work. Yeah, it's they just, have no it's idea so what weird and risky they're like. making. They just watched Futurama and saw brains in jars and said, yes. Yeah, that's probably what happened. <laughs> but the in terms of the the questions it raises, like, I'm sure there will be legislature that comes through saying how or what you should do with brains in terms of reanimating them. Um, but it also raised questions of like, what is the cutoff for death? Uh, because what this experiment was trying to show was four, this happened four hours after the pigs were killed and they wanted it to be as long as possible to say, look, this was properly dead uh, and we restored some function and the prevailing mm -hmm. consensus before this was for a mammal's brains as soon as you get a couple of minutes of oxygen not going to the brain it's it's dead and unrecoverable um so this is yeah i guess they don't they don't restore any of, so the cell damage that happens from oxygen deprivation they don't actually restore any of that i don't think it's just that they manage to save the ones that haven't been damaged yet so the longer it's left dead, the less likely this is to work on a large scale in the brain. That's that's what I read into it anyway. But it would be interesting for like the pig itself if it did get to a stage where it could be considered conscious. Would it just be like going to sleep? And then it just kind of becomes aware again? I don't really understand how that would work. Yeah, because the sense, I mean, it, it's not, doesn't have eyes or skin. So and I, and the brain has no sensory. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have thing. any sort of senses. But people dream, right? You know, at night. And that's the similar yeah. where you're having no input, but you're still having feelings. 
But when you dream at night, are you not considered to be unconscious? Do pigs dream? <laughs> <laughs> We're going down really complicated questions here, but they're actually we know really all the answers at least. I don't. Yeah, I think we can say face in the fact that I don't think anybody knows the answers to these questions, or not properly anyway. They might be able to give bullshit answers like we're about we're about to do now, but <laughs> <laughs> at least we admit it. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, like if when you sleep, you dream. But does that mean the brains would just be there dreaming? I don't think so. Like, because that same function happens when you're asleep and when you're awake, right? In your brain, like what the scientists are actually restoring. Mm. Yeah, it's not it's not one phase or another. It's just gener- generic like activity. But how would that work? I, you know, with no sensory organs. Yeah, because the brain has like wake and sleep cycles and people who are in coma, sometimes they can still experience those. So like it is a lesser level than that, what they did. Um, But yeah, I don't know. Um, But (laughs) but 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 one of the the talking points around this was that, um, you know, in the future, if they ever got it to the stage where it wasn't uh, invasive and they didn't have to take the brain out of your your head and, Mm -hmm. and got it controlled for people. Then it could prolong the amount of time that somebody, you know, could be saved and it would like decimate the amount of organs that become available for transplant because people would never um, want to say they're dead. But yeah, because for, if you get to say if you're like in a car crash or something, mm-hmm. you get to a hospital and you're declared dead because there's no brain activity or something. Um, that would no longer be the case. Yeah. And, they, and currently if like an ambulance arrives on the scene of your crash and you're dead, they'll pump uh, pump stuff through your veins to keep your organs preserved for transplant um, yeah. as well. So it's it's kind of weird that the ambulance is arriving with stuff <laughs> ready to harvest your organs. <laughs> but, but but it's also it's also strange because that's essentially what you would be doing with the brain, and then suddenly you're still alive. So it's very. Yeah. Oh, so many, so many ethical quandaries we have. <laughs> but but the other like avenue that's probably developing as fast as as this technology is growing organs organically in mm-hmm. dishes or in pigs. Pigs again. What? Or Bacon, or organically as well. Organs. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> but like that would that would you know solve the whole transplant problem forever if you could just grow organs. Um, yeah, and, I imagine would they have to be like, I don't know, would people donate their own DNA to be like, here are my set of grown extra kidneys and uh, my livers and my lungs, or would it just be a generic like company that just grows yeah. compatible organs for everybody? I don't really know how that would work, but not something I really looked at. <laughs> yeah, but I, I read somewhere that people were talking about, you know, in 100 years, what will seem very strange that we did now. And one of the things they were saying was that people would transfer organs between people. They were like, that'll just seem so odd to, to do that. But What do you mean just trans? I mean, people now donate organs, right? As in, yeah, that will seem weird in the future when people just have organs grown in a lab bespoke for them and then transfer. And if you need a lung. Oh, you just swap them in and out. But the fact someone would like have one of my lungs or a dead guy's lungs. Yeah. Yeah, they'll just think that's really weird. It'd be like just going to the dentist now or something, and they're like, "Here's a set of dentures." <laughs> or like, it's actually a kidney. Yeah. yeah, I just took out this tooth earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I was wondering though, if you had the option to be preserved as just a brain without a body, would you do that? In you know, in like if you could just keep living keep experiencing but then your level of experience really dramatically drops so it kind of i guess it depends if you want to like live forever and how much weight you put behind the word live (laughs) well yeah i mean if you were in like a vegetative state after some like accident in a hospital you know it's like would you say your wishes are like pull the plug or keep me going because this life is great you know, it's probably not too dissimilar until they can actually have. I mean, there are companies who are trying to translate brainwave activity into actual uh, 
data in terms of like images and words and stuff. So maybe someday if you were a brain on a table like this, they could actually infer what you're trying to say. But at the moment, I think it'd be a crap time. Yeah, I mean, it would be pretty shit, but like, <laughs> um, it, it just it it is weird to think that it would you would literally just be sitting there with no way to convey anything. But it kind of got me thinking about that theory. I don't know if you heard about it before. It was like Boltzmann brains. It's like a, some sort of physics thought experiment, mm. um, and it's basically a, like a Boltzmann brain is something that's self aware, um. And it basically they arise like randomly through like random fluctuations um, of states. So that, that stuff that's out of thermodynamic equilibrium, which is just crazy to uh, think about. And like the actual thought experiment is kind of complex to convey. But basically the idea is that the most common software entity that would arise from this would just be like brains that would just be aware, just a bunch of uh, neurons or whatever. But is the argument just that your brain is a load of atoms and the universe is infinite. So it's not impossible that somewhere those atoms will just coalesce even for a, a second into a brain that's consciousness or that's conscious. And you'd be like, Hey, I'm a, and then. Yeah. It didn't even have to be for a second, but yeah, it would essentially just be like, you just randomly find brains uh, throughout the universe that are conscious, but can never do anything because they're just brains. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. It's it's kind of terrifying that you're just going to like random places and just finding a brain sitting there. <laughs> Your research seems very highbrow and uh, and compared to what I'm about to say, <laughs> which, <laughs> which led me down this hole. Which is, I was actually thinking of uh, what it'd be more like without a head. Um, <laughs> okay, that's completely different. But <laughs> it's, it's like the exact opposite. But did did you ever hear of uh, Mike the headless chicken? I have, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you want to explain what a Mike the Headless Chicken is? Well, he's he's just the chicken that someone tried to uh, kill um, by chopping off his head, but they missed his jugular vein and his brainstem, um, but he very much had no head, and he lived for 18 months um, by wow. the, the farmer was just putting food down his hole, uh, his throat hole, <laughs> <laughs> as they say. <laughs> um, his esophagus but, fat. <laughs> <laughs> Throat. <laughs> a technical term but yeah. i mean it's it's weird that you know breathing heart and all that stuff it's all just controlled by the brainstem so even though he had no um higher order activity he's still no, perfectly no happy and desires <laughs> yeah yeah but then you know then it's it's just weird what do you, like does he still have human rights or like animal rights at that time human i mean rights. <laughs> Yeah, well, animal. He, it is it is interesting if he doesn't have a head. I think he probably would still. Um, animal rights would probably still apply. I doubt human rights would apply, but um, but it would probably say to just kill him because it would probably be in pain, right? He he actually got off better though than that because there's an annual um, Mike the Headless Chicken Day in Colorado every year, where it's a whole festival <laughs> where they have things like uh, races without a head and. Uh, egg and spoon race where you're blind and stuff that's very that's weird <laughs> so, so weird 18 uh, months is a seriously long time though yeah I mean very long and apparently it was very healthy and uh, <laughs> worked out every day ran <laughs> up and down the pen <laughs> um, and the other issue which this kind of ties in so obviously in if this was a person they would be called dead instantly because they're essentially like brain dead is the definition that's normally used for death um mm -hmm. and not having your brain certainly qualifies as brain dead um mm -hmm. but there are a load of different definitions of death and it, you know it used to be that if your lungs stopped working or uh, your heart stopped beating then you were dead but now that's been pulled back because they can restore that with defibrillators and such um and and I suppose what this research is likely to do is make it so that well just because your brain activity ceases for a few minutes doesn't mean you're you're fully dead um, for four hours. And actually, a quote that was used in not the Nature paper but the Nature article that was written about it um, was from mm -hmm. the the film The Princess Bride, uh, saying there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. Um, 
but it's it's funny that they quoted first of all the princess bride but it <laughs> yeah. but it's very much true that it's it's such a, like the reason death is kind of hard to define is because life is hard to define because i mean trees are alive but aren't conscious and then vi- viruses or everyone is confused about viruses um yeah but uh unfortunately there is a wikipedia article uh, entitled premature burial and, oh no i don't want this, <laughs> that sounds horrific please no <laughs> uh so like and as recent as 2014 in um <laughs> pariah pariah p-e-r-a-i-a in a place in greece a 45 year old woman uh, was buried alive and then just died of asphyxiation um so she was declared dead in hospital but then children playing near the cemetery heard screams from inside the earth <laughs> and when they did absolutely it, terrific okay so, so that was 2014 right 2015 like my worst fear. a year later a separate incident also occurred in the same region of greece Berea. Uh, oh a 49 year old woman was buried alive after being declared dead due to cancer um only later her family reported they could hear screams from inside the cemetery and this is all terrifying, but it's fun. Just never, never go to Greece if you have any health issues. I think because the... <laughs> they're so they're so quick to say, "Yep, you're dead." I oh, know. Yeah. Just... I'm just asleep, just having a nap. But back in the olden days, when um, it's often parried in TV and stuff, and they used to have those uh, cemeteries with uh, bells. So if you're die, if you're uh, buried alive, there was bells down to your grave, and you could. Um, pull it and let people know you're still alive which i presume never that's how, actually that's like how unsure people were back then whether <laughs> people were, it's like it was so common <laughs> yeah yeah uh all of this though has made me really glad that we're in physics where there's no ethical quandaries really at the same level like any funding for research uh, there's a huge section for ethics that anyone in medicine or biology has to fill in and we just say yeah we'll we won't and a yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah like if it's actually i'm trying to think like it's probably just physics and computer science everything else biology like everything i think yeah chemistry i guess you probably get away with a lot of chemistry that doesn't have any ethical issues but then if that but, can uh, be used for stuff that like yeah i mean if it's pharmaceutical or biochemical then you probably would have some mm-hmm. something to say <laughs> yeah um there's something i thought about as well when like i was reading the this article about the pigs but it it kind of raises a weird question about what is it about brains that makes them experience things that like so makes one brain a, a human experience and another brain a pig experience like obviously the biology is different but at the end of the day it's the same kind of process that's going on you know neurons firing and obviously the human one is more complex but it is weird like what is it that makes it different between like what's these levels of consciousness because if like the mechanisms are very similar Mm. you know i don't know Uh, if you get what i'm trying to say (laughs) i do in that like uh, and also because you know we're so defined by uh our body as well so like if you put a brain's (laughs) is all getting a bit crazy now but if you put a brain a pig's <laughs> brain in a human like it would would its experience be almost more human like and yeah it's all i mean their brain structure is so similar in all evolved mammals and it's not even size that defines the experience either because like our complex experience because lots of animals have bigger brains than us so i yeah. mean it's it's weird i would say would be my summary of it <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just found it a kind of a weird concept because I think we spoke about that before. The idea of like, like consciousness is just a pattern rather than the matter underlying what mm. is, what makes the pattern run on. Like, you know, you're running that pattern on a biological brain, or if you're running that pattern on a load of transistors in a computer, there is that idea that you can still make a brain either way. Obviously, yeah. at the minute we only have biological ones. But then the difference between all the biological ones is it literally just a complexity issue. Like if you had a more complex pig brain, could it become more conscious than, uh, say, a normal pig brain or something like a chicken? It's kind of yeah. hard to know. Or if you could re- like replicate a pig's brain, yeah, not only in a like computer basis, but 
in a mechanical basis. I mean, once you had the firing time, there's no reason why you couldn't make it into an abacus. Like if it's actually just information mm. patterns flowing and if it's a cycle, like it's, it's, it's so weird. <laughs> but, but, but it's like abstract to, stuff. But yeah, like today, like that kind of, those science questions are where certain things like gravitational waves and stuff were a hundred years ago or special relativity or there was so much people didn't know about huge areas of physics and they knew it was confusing, but never, uh, same with evolution before the theory came along, everyone was just like, oh, look at all these animals and some are similar and some aren't. And Yeah, they're like, well, humans are great because of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, We're and that's kind of, but that's the 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 excuse for uh, a lot of brain complexity now, you know. God made us smart. God made us extra complex. He loves that complexity. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if we find a brain floating in space, that'd be. We we have to label it like based on what we think, like pig brain, uh, human brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There'll be like certain levels. There'll be a scale, like the Richter yeah. scale, but for brains. <laughs> anyway, I uh, yeah, I uh, I I had a great time reading about all this stuff, but it was it was way too. I mean, there's the there's so many angles uh, to take from it, mm. and it's. It'd be nice to have like a neuroscientist here and also a philosopher. <laughs> and a farmer. <laughs> Tell us more about the pig. <laughs> a pig farmer. <laughs> and somebody from Yale that was on the research team. <laughs> I mean, that was the other interesting thing that, that they just took pigs from an abattoir. So it wasn't like they had to very carefully surgically remove the head or anything. Like there would have been just put very like uh, brutally just chopped off, you know, not... um not precisely snipped at the yeah yeah not like the chicken or yeah. actually very much like the chicken i mean <laughs> yeah um and there was a interesting little bit at the end where they were they kind of cleared up misconceptions that people would or wouldn't have so like what is possible or what does this mean because it's mm-hmm. because it's so sci-fi it can kind of um lead to i'm sure there's a load of news articles that are concluding the wrong things like we are about zombies um <laughs> no you could definitely like like go wild with it and turn it into proper sci-fi but they're saying what what isn't anytime soon at all is like brain transplantation like that's so um not what they're able to do and also like immortality the idea of just oh you die and putting your brain in a vat and just then you go um and yeah. then of course the brain of that thing is a whole other uh, philosophy problem of how do you know you're that's not you you're not in a vat in a stanford lab um hooked in, mm-hmm. into brain x version five uh yeah and also there's something else they said it was like we don't even know if we're actually bringing back full brain activity or just delaying the inevitable which is mm. interesting as well like i mean i think they they kept them like kept them hooked up to the brain X system for a max of 36 hours, which is pretty impressive, but like, they don't know if they kept running that, would it just eventually die anyway? Or, you know, so there's a lot of time issues there. Or would it get stronger? (laughs) The pig Frankenstein. (laughs) Yeah. Man, bear, pig. Uh, Yes. And a bigger brain is generally smarter this is a little segue into our next segment. Um, bigger brains are generally better, but why are some animals bigger than others? What's with that? We'll tell you after the break. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> we should definitely have some music in there.
Sewin uh, Aeon Magazine, an online publication. There was an article where they were discussing whether bigger animals are always better. And this led us down a rabbit hole of that very question. Like, why are some animals massive and some tiny? And and is it better? Yeah, how, to how, but how big was the rabbit that lived in this rabbit hole? <laughs> it was smaller than the hole. Anyway. Okay. So. Okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that then. <laughs> Yeah, I, I find this topic actually very, very interesting because um, it's a lot of things you'd never actually consider uh, until you just read about it and you're like, oh my God, yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. But uh, an example in that article was between like the goby little fish and the whale shark that were like, you know, living in the same environment, you know, right beside each other. And there's a whole eight orders of magnitude in uh, the difference of their weight, which is crazy. But you said you think this topic is interesting, but that's only because it's a biology topic that once you dig into it is actually largely based on physics. And it's mostly physical arguments about how size scales. That That is true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as complicated as our pig topic that we just came yeah. from. <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah, it, it it's it's strange the way evolution found a way that both uh, in working in or living in the same environment, something that's a tenth of a gram versus um, tons, 34 tons, is are both perfectly suited to living there and have found niches, um, yet live very different lives. Very different. So I think um, one of the first things I looked at when I was reading this was the Cope's Rule. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is interesting. But basically, Cope's Rule states that uh, organisms will tend to become bigger over time due to evolution. Um, and an example of that is the dinosaurs, which probably had one of the longest stretches of uninterrupted time to evolve um, and started off as quite small reptiles and became quite large, like the T-Rex, which was what the largest uh, land carnivore. Um, so the kind of idea behind the rule is that being bigger is beneficial, but obviously that's not always the case. Um, and so the reason it would be beneficial is, you know, you can fight off predators or avoid them it's easier to get prey it's easier to kill your competitors uh that kind yeah of thing. usually if you're bigger as well you've got um uh, more variety in your diet that lets you uh survive kind of more extremes um usually um you live you live for much longer if you're bigger which gives you longer time to invest in like reproduction. So like raising uh, children and stuff. So um, that's interesting. Also, usually there's increased intelligence is that generic scaling of like, if your brain is bigger, you're usually slightly smarter. Like, you know, a mm. whale is more complex than a fruit fly or whatever. Mm. Um, what else was there? There was something else I wanted to say and I've forgotten. Oh yeah, you can survive much better through like any sort of uh, lean time. So like you know, if there's a famine or whatever, you have more reserves that you can live off and live for longer. Whereas if you're something small, usually you'll die faster because you have much more, much higher dependence on like intake of food and stuff. So yeah, during yeah, that's 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 true. And then during the so so the, during the the um, period up until recently animals tended to get bigger and now they've all kind of disappeared mm -hmm. all of the massive ones i mean i saw <laughs> uh, i can't actually remember where i saw it, but there was the whole um effect of like humans causing megafauna extinction which was interesting so like it's pretty much linked that uh, humans have uh, made the giant ground sloth extinct and a couple of megafauna that were from australia when they arrived in australia they just caused all of these animals to go extinct which is probably just because we hunted them to extinction but um i saw that and, and i was surprised so i looked into it a bit a bit more and it was the case that animals kept getting bigger especially after the dinosaurs died mammals got really large and about 125,000 years ago they started disappearing but all it takes like the pressure required to make an animal go, go extinct like once the hunting is, uh, of the animal is enough to keep the 
uh, fertility rate below the level of replacement, then the population just will eventually collapse. So like it, it's not, you know, over the course of thousands of years, uh, it's not like yeah. you have to go out and just slaughter them all um, immediately. Um, yeah, something interesting as well about that was the lily put effect. I don't know if you mm. came across that. But basically the lily put effect is that there's usually a decrease in body size in uh, in animal species that have survived a major extinction. So any reptiles that survived, say, like the dinosaur extinction, uh, over the coming like generations became much smaller. And it's because, obviously, the extinction uh, would probably lead to much harsher times. So then to be more efficient, they would become smaller. Um, yeah. And, uh, but interesting the way there's kind of a general shift from like being small to being large, and then something will happen, and then there'll be a shift to being small again and then being large. Um yeah, so what so what you're saying is, over, if there's you know one summer or one winter where there's no food, then it's better to be big because you have the body fat. But ultimately, if there's a a thing where you need to evolve quickly to find a new niche, then being small, you can get through generations much faster. And you yeah. do, you're young, you generally just have tons of. So there's the Ortiz selection rule. If you came across that, mm-hmm. where there's a trade-off between the quantity and quality of offspring and bigger animals tend to have fewer offspring that they put a lot of effort into like people are always going on about their babies but but if i was a <laughs> frog i would just have loads of tadpoles and let them all go. i wouldn't care just, about them at all <laughs> they'd all just get eaten <laughs> immediately <laughs> but it is odd even looking at like you're saying humans may have uh taken a lot of the large mammals out of um the scene like mm-hmm. we're not really alone in that. If you, even if you're watching any David Attenborough show, like any of the the big cats or even like some of the hunting dogs, like any animal over terrestrial carnivores over about prey on larger, not smaller organisms, which is which is a funny trait to have. So like there is a an evolutionary thing, even if humans weren't in the picture, a little feedback mechanism to stop animals getting too big because the bigger you get, then you're also a um a tasty treat (laughs) yeah but i wonder like what actually causes that um so like why is there at some point if you're a carnivore at some point you suddenly start preying on things that are bigger than you yeah like i don't i don't know why that would obviously is it more is it more so to do with the fact that the prey is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as well with generations Mm. maybe i don't know and the best thing about this is how uh, the the different, and I think it's what we, what originally was interesting about it, that the different properties scale with increasing size. Um, so if an animal is, you know, uh, your size, My- <laughs> <laughs> and then they make them ten times bigger. You know, mm-hmm. your okay. So your your size increases by a factor of ten, but your surface area will increase by a factor of a hundred, and your volume will increase by a factor of a thousand. So yeah. your proportions change, and everything messes up. Um, mm-hmm. And the article I was reading about this was actually um, from the Smithsonian magazine, where they were arguing about whether King Kong is realistic. Uh, so they were asking if an 80 pound ape is, is possible. Uh, they had to open with a quote where they were saying that um, it's uh, not real, first of all, which is kind of <laughs> annoying. <laughs> um, and the annoying thing actually is they also finished their final paragraph, they had a line saying, scientifically speaking, it may be a bit of a leap to say King Kong is uh, is possible. But scientists aren't willing to fully rule out the possibility. It's like, but no, they are. It's who's, just, yeah, who's, who's not fully ruling it? Yeah, but it's classic. Get that uh, person up here now, and we'll we'll talk to them. The way those interesting, are always written. Yeah, an interesting thing is the um. So, a couple of things then also depend on, say, surface area specifically and volume specifically. So, uh, air resistance is something that depends on your surface area. Uh, it'll also depend on your volume um, kind of indirectly because usually you will be more massive. Um, so the example of this is if you drop like 
uh, an ant from the top of like a skyscraper or if you drop an elephant like the ant will hit the ground and be pretty much fine like it'll have no injuries whereas the elephant will like explode <laughs> yeah and just turn into goo like um and it's just because the uh, surface area to volume of the ant is uh, such higher ratio than the surface area of the elephant to its its volume so you've all that kinetic energy um yes yeah, basically localized just... in one one space and also the air resistance will slow one down over the other but um it's just interesting that like you know something like falling is basically has no effect to an insect uh but for like even humans like we're very susceptible if we fall from anywhere we're going to hurt ourselves and um, mm. and then elephants are fucked but <laughs> there, there's even an issue with giraffe uh, giraffes when they're pregnant and they give birth to their young if when they fall just as they're born they can die often as well um which is just small small down that's a but, really weird way to evolve yeah, isn't it yeah but but it, as you're saying about surface area like so many things depended on it in that your intestines will also have more surface area so you can absorb nutrients better um and the other um example was our susceptibility to water and the surface tension of water the bigger mm-hmm. you are the less you notice it but if you're an insect and you just put them in a puddle or in a drop of water they just can get stuck and die yeah they'll get like sucked in it can even just be like a drop of water and they just get mm-hmm. sucked into the drop of water and then drown mm-hmm. but uh something really interesting about this was i looked at like the smallest insect is um a fairy fly and I think there's a couple of different species of fairy fly, but they're really, really small and they look real freaky. Um, they're like half a millimeter in length or roughly, I think that's the average. Um, and they don't really have like wings like a normal fly would have. It's kind of like like hairy arms <laughs> because <laughs> the, the air is like uh, viscous to them. Mm. So air, like air to them is like water is to us kind of, which is mad to think about like their whole perception of what like they just think they're swimming around in air yeah but it's actually and to us it's so like not in the way you know yeah things fall down but but that's one of the reasons that you know the blue whale is the largest mammal ever because you know if you put a blue whale on land it can sustain uh injuries that it will die from just because it's not in water and doesn't have the pressure of the water to support its organs and it'll yeah will be sore um so yeah they, sore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he'll have a rough old time but but i mean like the blue whale is so i mean i let me have it run down here somewhere up to 190 like 30 meters yeah, yeah 30 meters real big yeah it is crazy to think like the difference between like the pressure of air and water is so vast that you end up with a either a fairy fly or a blue whale <laughs> the yeah, scales are just to... enormous like that's that's basically how these effects are scaling it gives mm. you those variances in in like orders of magnitude um and, and the the african bull elephant is the largest land mammal currently and it's it's something like six meters and 10 tons or bush elephant so it's it's much smaller than a blue whale but if you wanted to scale that up to a blue whale because it's vol its mass is going up you need much thicker legs you much need much thicker like much more of your mass has to be dedicated to bone to support your structure you have to mm-hmm. eat way more i mean it's yeah you have to you either more need energy stronger in. bones you either need stronger bones or bigger bones to support that effect because mm. the rest and, of your bones will just snap right and 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 in the case of the giraffe, I mean, it its neck evolved to be long, so it can eat from the tops of trees, but its neck can't be twice as long because then its heart has to have more uh, force to pump blood uh, against yeah. the pressure up to its brain and stuff. So it's there; it's so much harder to be big. It is interesting how the size of the environment has like shaped evolution of those. Uh, species and stuff like it's so different and so specific to to the environment it's just uh, baffles me but um something i thought was really interesting was that even say if you took like i don't know something small like uh, a mouse like creature or something like and a um, yes like a mess or a shrew let's let's go with a shrew <laughs> and if you made that like really big um to the size of an elephant somehow 
um the it would just like it wouldn't work in terms of its cells and its metabolism are too fast so like uh and your average shrew has to like eat uh twice its body weight a day to keep its metabolism working because its volume is so small compared to its surface area it loses a lot of heat and the way it evolved to deal with this was that it the its cells kind of like run over time and like generate a lot of heat and then to power that it needs a huge appetite to like you know so it eats like 200 percent of its uh body weight a day whereas like an elephant is something like five percent of its body weight a day because it's got such a large volume and such a small surface area that like you know they have actually developed their ears to be so big to lose heat because they're so bad at losing heat yeah i mean Um, imagine uh, like i was eating 140 kilos of food a day (laughs) isn't that insane (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you don't even have to go to an elephant size like a human size you can see the difference is just crazy but if you t- if you were to think like if you were to just make a, a mouse that big or like you were saying like king kong like if you were to make a gorilla that big its cells would be generating way too much heat so it would most likely explode uh, or melt one or the <laughs> other depending if it's like proteins denatured or in time <laughs> But that's it's crazy to think about that. Like it's not yeah. something that you would ever consider in any science fiction. Yeah, um, and there is a very strong correlation between the size of the animal and how fast its heart beats, and and then also how long it lives. So generally, if the bigger you are, the longer you live, the slower your heart, and it all comes back to the metabolism. And it's where that yeah. uh, rule came about, you know, rule of thumb, where you get a certain amount of heartbeats in a lifetime, and generally across all organisms this is roughly the same so an elephant will have as just about as many heartbeats as a shrew but it's living much longer but its heart's beating slower um but that was my biggest problem with the movie big where he becomes big overnight i'm like but but what about the pressure (laughs) what about the heat generation (laughs) (laughs) and does this have anything to do with the fact that dinosaurs which got so there's like a titanosaur i think that got like 40 meters almost but they're all cold-blooded so they're uh, but yeah yeah. i don't think i think it applies more to mammals because they don't have cells that generate their own heat they work differently and i'm not really sure exactly how they work i'm no reptile (laughs) (laughs) um I have the, nothing else to say. No, I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, you think about that for a second. I'll entertain our listeners. If you put animals on Mars, because this is all driven by gravity, if you put them on Mars, they would actually evolve to be larger because gravity is slightly less. Um, so if we were to ever, you know, discover life on another planet, properly a fully evolved life and not just like simple cells, they could be massive or tiny, little tiny people, depending on what the gravity is like on their system. Yeah, because it'll be more efficient either way. But it's very mm. interesting. I and mean, you're kind of limited by like the actual material properties of things like bone. Like maybe they could be the same size, but instead of their bones, you know, being carbon and like calcium and things like that, it's actually some other element, which is interesting as well. Oh, Although yeah. everything on most bones on the earth are all the same material, aren't they? I don't really know. Yeah, there. But it is yeah. interesting to contemplate. I did remember the thing I wanted to say earlier. Okay. It's actually interesting, like pregnant women that um when before they give birth, the baby has the metabolic rate of the the mother, but after they give birth, their metabolism speeds up to generate more heat. Mm. So essentially before birth they're behaving like any of the other organs, and then afterwards they become like basically their own being but they're it's crazy to think that like their metabolism just speeds up and i think it takes like four hours or something um and it's weird the way that that evolution has like made that happen and it's just because of their surface area like once they're outside because they're not exposed to outside obviously before birth and then afterwards they are so they lose a lot more heat so their You're metabolism baby, has to speed up before a baby is born it's just another organ just get it <laughs> <laughs> Repeal. That is crazy. Repeal. 
but yeah, that is that is so cool the way yeah, it all just kicks into gear and and can find it like as a physics problem, it's just finding the local mac or local minimum of the like it's just optimizing to the surroundings. Yeah, it's like just getting that equilibrium basically. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and then also across all these orders of magnitude from people and the tiny fish you were talking about initially and the the whale like there's such a similar structure across all mammals as well so it's not like having different a different size means you need a different structure altogether like they all have brains brain stem and and stuff it it all that changes is really the metabolic rate that's the parameter that's fiddled with yeah but again like you have the whole issue of if you're in water you can get to be a lot bigger because it's more buoyant and stuff than mm-hmm. if you're on land it is very interesting there's so many different factors that kind of coincide to make animals evolve into the way they are um and then of course yeah <laughs> just the amount of the amount of food uh that's available in terms of um like king kong the most uh, yeah, another stupid thing about king kong was that he's on this tiny island where there would never be enough food to support him um <laughs> But one of the yeah, reasons, I don't know how much gorillas eat a day, but it's probably significant enough. Probably saying, similar to humans. Yeah. But one of, one of the reasons that also allowed the blue whale to get big, apart from being in water, is that it has the freedom to to travel huge distances uh, every day and it can eat um, a few tons a day. Oh. Uh, 1.5 million uh, calories versus our 2,000. But again, it's not actually that much given that they're 30 tons like versus eating twice your because of percentage of your body body weight. Oh, yeah. It's like it's pretty similar to humans, right? Maybe a slightly more. But yeah, yeah, um, that is crazy. St- Interesting sizes of life. So you're saying an elephant can explode if you push it out a window. I was saying elephants never uh, yeah there's some some quote from uh, one of the articles I read saying like oh, if you drop a like a, a mouse down an elevator shaft it'll like kind of bounce and be a bit stunned but it'll be grand and then if you drop a human down they'll like break their legs and die break <laughs> probably all of the bones in their body and die very quickly and then if you drop like a horse down it'll just slosh around <laughs> <laughs> slosh yeah slosh is such a such a vivid <laughs> yeah and even the word the term or the verb to drop a human it really may sound like it's against their will <laughs> down an elevator shaft but this is one of the it was, reasons it that... was against the horse as well as well <laughs> wasn't but... suicidal <laughs> babies often not often but um survive uh large falls and one of the reasons is that they're just so malleable <laughs> How often? <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a study on it. N is 500 uh, for the study I'm reading. 500 babies dropped from various heights. <laughs> Remember those trolley experiments you had to do for leaving cert physics with the two yeah. <laughs> mechanics? Uh, elasticity. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, the only problem I found to all this is that it's nice to talk about in the abstract in a sense of how things scale. Um, but it, it's the physics problem of the spherical cow uh, where it's a, like there's probably yeah, I mean, more realistic models. This is the thing with all of these biological rules is they're much like softer than physics rules. So like if some physical law will state, you know, protons do this or something and it will be exactly that and it will never break it. Whereas mm-hmm. in biology, there seems to like always kind of be a couple of outliers or like a couple of particular cases that will book the trend that's because biology is actually complicated mm. and like <laughs> oh way more complex yeah uh, yeah well i mean i'm i'm sufficiently uh satisfied that we did it justice <laughs> <laughs> i'm sufficiently satisfied that the listener got a good overview <laughs> of different sized animals <laughs> Yeah, now for the next 15 minutes, we will list animals in ascending order of size. <laughs> Fairy flies. <laughs> but actually on that, I mean, that's why they, you know, one of the benefits of biology labs often use things like zebrafish and fruit flies to do experiments because you can breeze through like 50 generations in 
Um, yeah, or like little teeny like worms that are like microscopic. Yeah. What's that one? E power bends power I can't remember now, but, That's but yeah, all these like tiny, tiny little creatures that you can get through like yeah, hundred generations and see actual evolution happening. Sea it's monkeys. Very interesting. No. <laughs> Do you never have sea monkeys for before your time? They're, they real though. Yeah, sea monkeys. What are they? Yeah, what are they? Oh, they're just little shitty bacteria or something. Yeah. Um, kind of disappointing. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that means we're wrapping up. Unless you well, want to just listen to me talk for your... another yeah. ten minutes. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. guys. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Follow us on the internet, and in the meantime, yeah, follow us on Twitter because our Twitters we need to get that going. Yeah, it's pretty embarrassing, but we, so have... we need to start tweeting more often. Yes. Any follower will get a guaranteed shout out in the next three days. Yeah. Um, yes. Cool, yeah, and talk to you soon. <laughs>